Amber Dermont. I'm a fiction writer. I'm the author of the novel The Starbird Sea and the short story collection Damage Control. I'm in town for the Iowa Book Festival. I think that, you know, the question that, that burns inside all readers is, you know, um, can you tell me a story? <laughs> What's your story? Um, I'm often just asked to, you know, to, to sort of tell, um, tell about the story underneath the story, uh, to talk about where stories come from and, and why. And, and I think readers really hunger for a narrative around the process and act of writing so that it, it isn't just the story that they want, they want to know where it comes from and you know, where it makes it its own home in your heart. Um, I just read, uh, for my collection, I read a short story, part of a story called Stella at the Winter Palace, and I only had time to read about half of it. And afterwards, you know, it was so lovely. It's always lovely when, when people want to continue reading your, your book and find out what happened. But, um, you know, they wanted to know, like, where did that story come from? And um, it's about, a, it's about a, a young woman who pretends to be uh, a, a granddaughter. She's a, sort of like a, an escort um, for, uh, she's a professional granddaughter. And she's on a cruise with a woman named Stella, and Stella disappears. And the, you know, the question is always like, who is Stella? And you know, it happens that my grandmother's name is Stella. And um, it happens that I once was on a cruise with her. <laughs> and it happens that she did once disappear. Um, but that's sort of the least interesting thing about the story, I often think and say. And it's the sort of the flight, you know, the, the, the flight of the imagination. Um, you know, where, where the story comes from should, I think, ultimately remain a, a kind of mystery for the reader. I'm a funny person because I, I, I need a lot of noise in my life. I actually love to, to think through, um, through the noise, to sort of break through the noise. And um, so when I'm at home, I write in home, I often write in bed. I, I um, find myself listening to, I'll listen to a podcast and I'll um, have uh, music on and the television blaring and all of that, through all of that madness, if I can think through that, if I can concentrate through that um, and come out on the other side of it with a story, with a sentence, with an image, with a line, if, if I can you know, push beyond the distraction into a world of my own imagining, then I know I'm really onto something, then I, I know that I can really do something. Um, there's a, I just moved to Houston, Texas, and there's this space that if I could just set up shop there, I would write there for the rest of my life. It's, um, it's in the, the Cy Twomley Museum. There's this one room that has a, a triptych, a painting called Say Goodbye Catullus to the Shores of Asia Minor. And um, it's 13 feet tall and about 52 feet long. And it's you know it's sort of Cy Twombly. It's sort of his masterwork of all of his scribbles and all of his sort of like you know graffiti. And um, it's in a room that's pure natural light. And it's the kind of place that people you know often have like a very spiritual experience when they're they're in this room with there's only that painting in the room and two benches. And you know people have been known to like take their clothes off just to like stand in front of this painting. And I I tried to convince once the guards to just like you know sort of let me spend the night <laughs> you know in this room. And I think I could write something. I think I could write something really extraordinary in that room. If if I could have any quiet space in the world, I would have that. You know, I was very lucky. Um, I studied with um, Andre de Buse III, who is uh, the, the son of Andre de Buse, and he uh, once said to me, you know, you gotta be able to write anywhere. You know, you have to be able to write on the back of a flatbed truck with sand blowing in your eyes. You know, you can't make excuses, and I think people, you know, the more free time you have, the more likely you are to waste that time and the more likely you are to create too much comfort in your life. And I'm at my best, I think, as, as, a, as, a, as a writer, as an artist, when I'm very occupied, when I have a tremendous amount of responsibility, and when I really have to, you know, show some discipline. And, um, you know, I, I know Andre used to write uh, he used to drive to like a graveyard and write in his car, park his car in like the wee hours of the morning. Um, and uh, I think that uh, for me, uh, I am, I mean, I could be in 
standing in an elevator, and if, it, if a line hits me, it hits me, and I, I, can, I can make something out of it. I mean, when I'm, if I'm really lucky, um, I get to go to the ocean, I get to go to the, the water. And when I lived here years ago as a grad student, um, you know, it's a very hard thing to be from, you know, Cape Cod, to be from the Northeast, and, and to just sort of take, take the ocean, never take it for granted, but take it as a, a kind of luxury that, that features in your daily life. Um, to come to the Midwest, what was extraordinary to me is so many people have boats, <laughs> you know, which is lovely. Um, and, and there are all of these lakes, and you know, many of them are man-made. But um, I, would, I had a very dear friend, um, Susan Gildersleeve, who's a brilliant writer, so smart. She was like the, the Flannery O'Connor of our, our class. Um, and I used to beg her to come with me to the to the lake. And Susan was from from Florida, but she was from Gainesville, um, and she just humored me. You know, she 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 really was. You know, I, I learned years later that she was always so angry at me that I would make her and come with me to Lake McBride. But there's something about seeing the water that gives me a kind of calm and a kind of instruction, and um, it's sort of the ideal way for me to think about, you know, how, just how small my own life is and how, you know, what a minor character we all are and yet, you know, there, we can still bear witness to this, you know, the, the extraordinary. And so there's something to that, even if, you know, the most sort of uh, minor character in life can stake out a claim on beauty uh, and, uh, you know, sort of see the ocean as something, you know, where it's not just that all life comes from there. It's that it's, it's in many ways like, you know, all we have, we have the land, we have the sea, and we have the sky, <laughs> you know, and that's sort of it. Um, and uh, the water for me is, is everything. It's, it's, it's really the, the, the thing that gives me balance and meaning. You know, the, the great joy in my life is, um, and I think the secret, my secret, you know, um, life that I wish I had the courage to lead, um, I'm fascinated by stand-up comedy. And I'm really, especially, you know, uh, enamored of, of very experimental comedians and, and people who really deconstruct the form and the act of being a stand-up. And um, there's a comedian named Stuart Lee, uh, who's a, he's a British comedian. And um, he, his, his work doesn't excerpt very well. Like you have to sort of watch an entire performance to, to get it. But he, he will do things like falsify a satirical nervous breakdown in the middle of his own act and leave the stage and you know run up to the balcony and then you know chastise people who are getting up to leave and and um, he just sort of takes every convention of the form and subverts it and that's what I always want to do you know I always want to take you know take the easy joke and turn it and spin it and 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 find out what's underneath it and the, you know where does it come from this impulse to want to make people laugh and how desperate and sad it is to to want to be the center of of uh, that laughter um, and that was a really big thing for for my stories for for um, people like I mean you know probably don't assume it's a fairly unlikely thing I guess that you know because especially the relationship between women and comedy which. Um, you know, Christopher Hitchens wrote this sort of famous essay that I think is often misunderstood um, about women in you know just not needing you know in terms of uh, evolution not needing to be funny and to me it's um, it's it's a dangerous and wonderful and unexpected thing to go to go and give a reading and and to you know have people think that they're going to have one experience and to completely subvert and delight and to give them permission to laugh. I really dislike the word get. There's something about, you know, G-E-T, when I see it written on the page, I, I cringe, you know. Um, there, so if I'm very cautious, um, there, there would seldom be an occasion where I would, I would use that word. Um, I think that, uh, you know, you really do have to put a tremendous amount of pressure on your, your language, and you have to be careful. I mean, there are some words that you can only afford to use once in a novel. Like you would only use the word luminous like once in a novel. Like it's too big of a word. Um, if you catch yourself using it twice, it's it's probably a lazy accident. 
Um, you know, I think that with short stories, especially how you use repetition and variation, um, you know, creates pattern and meaning and motif. But you, you really, you never want to go overboard with anything um, because you don't want it to seem too mechanized. Um, so I think you have to be very careful with language that might be too lush or ornate. Um, even when it's beautiful, if it doesn't serve the story, you have to get rid of it. I want very much, I'm working right now on, on a novel, and, and I think that when you, when you write a book, when you write a story, you have to pour out every part of yourself. You have to give away every aspect of your experience and imagination in service to that story. And um, you know that's why I think sometimes it, there's so much time in between novels for writers because you you do have to you, you do have to fill up again <laughs> on on images and on um, interactions and on characters on people and right now you know I I want always to to write about art art is very important to me um, and I also want to write about humor. And um, my novel, I think, you know, if, if, I, if, if I was pressed to ever say anything about it, you know, it's, it's, it's a very serious um, and, you know, solemn book, and there isn't a lot of, of humor in it. There are moments, but um, my stories are quite different, and I think that, um, you know, my hope is that there, there there's a, there's an energy around the humor, and that the the, the, the the humor is really necessary for the stories, that it isn't just a stunt. And my hope is just sort of being able to combine the two, you know, to sort of have that, that ability to make the reader laugh and cry, you know, simultaneously on every single page. Um, and so I want to sort of bring those two aspects of my writing together. I just don't think I know anything, you know. I don't think I, I have um, any real insight yet. I had dinner once with Rita Dove, and you know, it was astonishing to me that you know she was in the workshop with you know Jim Galvin and Jory Graham, and they were students together. And Louise Glick was their their teacher, and I would, Rita Dove said to me, you know, it's so amazing because I was so you know sort of uh, intimidated by her, but I realize now, like you know, she was almost as young as I was, and she only had two books, and you don't know anything when you only have two books. <laughs> and she said this to me, and I was sitting there, I was like, I have two books, I know nothing. <laughs> you know? And I think that there's a, you have to be very careful. People are very quick to want to wanna develop an ego around their own work and, and to hold forth, and, and I inherently mistrust that. You know, I, I, uh, I think, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm wary, I'm wary. I mean, I, it's, to me, um, to be an artist is to want desperately to connect and to communicate. And that's ultimately, I think, what, what spirituality is, you know, this desire to connect with something that's bigger than, than you, Some, you know, um, something that's mysterious. I mean, I'm really astonished by the mysteries of writing. Um, if there's ever anything beautiful that, that, that I've written, I didn't write it, you know, I was just, lucky enough to come across it in my imagination and, and to notice it. Um, you know, the, the beauty of writing is really the mystery of writing. And it's very difficult as a teacher because you spend so much time wanting to demystify the writing process, especially for your students. But I always hope that it, there's a little bit that sustains, there's a little bit of mystery that, that holds on. And, and that's what you have to sort of you know, appreciate and stand back and realize, you know, that the, the story is smarter than you are, the story has intentions um, that go beyond your intentions, and, you know, that's, if that's not spirituality, I don't know what is, you know. A writer is someone for whom writing is very difficult, you know, that's Thomas Mann, that's his definition, and I always have that uh, on, on any sort of syllabus that I hand out to students, and it's, for me, I'd love to get to the point where you know writing is just a sheer pleasure. But for me, it, it costs me something every time I put a word down on the page. You know, it takes something out of me, um, and it's uh, it's not easy. Um, and I and I don't say that in a you know overly dramatic way. Um, it really. It's, it's a kind of labor that, you know, I would, 
you know, I'd rather build boats, I'd rather, I'd rather paint a house, I'd rather cobble shoes, I'd rather do almost anything um, than sit down and write. And yet there's no better feeling than just having written. There's nothing better, nothing better.